for us. Lord, I am excited this morning, Lord. And Lord, my desire is that as we peer into the corridors of time, hear from voices that have spoken, whom the Holy Spirit has moved, that we would be humbled by their actions. We see their actions perhaps as a corrective to our own. But Lord, we're here most importantly, not so that we can know dates and times, but more importantly, so that we would know that Jesus is worthy. So Lord, help us now as we love you through the renewing of our mind, as we love you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let us have a fascination for the Reformation for the sake of Christ. That's our desire. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay. Well, I should tell you this from the outset. This is probably the second time I've done something like this. I am naturally a preacher. There is a difference between naturally preaching and teaching. And so, I came prepared with my manuscript. I have got my notes. Right? Other teachers, they, just, they can speak and do their thing. Um, so I'm not going to say I don't know what I'm doing. But here's what I will say. I'm going to go through this this first time. Uh, let me present to you what I have. Uh, and then at the end, we'll, we'll do questions. Okay, so... As time goes on, I'll probably get more comfortable with it, um, and, and you can interrupt in between. But for this first go-around, I what I want to do is I want to give you an introduction, and then we'll have time for, the, for questions at the end. Okay? Welcome to the Reformation class, folks. I am so thrilled because there's usually like two or three people that I know who have a bobblehead and are excited about the Reformation, and yet all of you are here. And so, uh, thanks for giving it a, a chance. The picture I have in front of you describes a scene. On April 16, 1521, a cart with a few companions uh, entered into the city of Worms. And uh, this cart was carrying an Augustinian German monk by the name of Martin Luther. He was a professor from Wittenberg, had been there uh, for about 10 years, about a decade or so, and he had been causing an uproar ever since the posting of his 95 Theses on uh, one night in October of 1517. And he had posted them on the Schlosskirche, the Wittenberg Castle Church door. And ever since that moment, those consequences had begun to unravel. And he was on a collision course with the Church of Rome because he had critiqued Rome, thinking he was doing it from the inside, and yet he blew everything up. And so that collision course was on its way. And now the moment had come where everything had come to a head. So Luther had been granted immunity and was summoned in front of King, or the Emperor, King Charles V, to plead his case. It was to do this in front of emperors, to do it in front of nobles, religious representatives, municipal representatives. And he did this at what is famously known as the Diet of Worms. Now, when I say diet, I'm not talking about weight loss here. Okay? <laughs> I'm talking about a, uh, a deliberative assembly to evaluate something. And so, to be honest, this wasn't really an opportunity for him to plead his case. It was really an opportunity for him to get in front of these people, have his books presented in front of him, and be asked the question, do you recant of what you have said against the mother church. His tracts are put in front of him, his books are put in front of him. And some of those books likely that he had written just the previous year, Babylonian Captivity of the Church, a little book that questioned the validity of whether there were so many sacraments in the sacramental system of the Catholic Church. He had whittled them all the way down to two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. This is contrary to the church, which had, which had said, and this is what Luther had said against them. He said, as the soul needs only the word of God for its life and righteousness, so it is justified by faith alone and not any works. This is from his other work, The Freedom of the Christian. For if it could be justified by anything else, it would not need the word, and consequently, it would not need faith. 
And so he writes these books, some against the sacramental system. He writes others that talk about the true, unadulterated belief in justification by faith. And he says it doesn't include works, it's faith. We talk about this on Sunday morning often. He's asked if these works are his, he acknowledges. But several accounts that I've read have said that as he's in front of these people, he was very nervous and... As his back was against the wall, he was intimidated. You could actually barely hear what he was saying in response. And so he was asked if he could have one more day to think it over. King Charles was actually shocked. I mean, shocked going, you're a professor, professor, shouldn't you have your ducks in a row by this moment? And so he's given one more day and he's brought in on April 18th, 1521 at six o'clock in the evening. And Johann Eck, is asked ask him directly and and Eck, the trier official says I ask you Martin answer candidly and without horns do you or do you not repudiate your books and the errors which they contain the reply that Luther gave is one for the history books here's what he said he said since then your majesty and your lordships desire a simple reply I will answer without horns and without teeth Unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither safe nor right. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. God help me. Amen. The monk had taken back none of his scathing rebukes of the church of his time. And he instead had placed final authority, not in councils, not in the Pope himself, not in the tradition of the church, but in God's word alone. We would later call this category uh, sola scriptura, scripture alone. We'll talk about that later. The painting Luther at the Diet of Worms by Anton Werner in 1877 depicts this climactic scene that we're talking about. The heroic moments were the Protestant Reformation really gets underway. And it's a wonderful picture to think about one man standing against the entire establishment, religious establishment, political establishment. You notice that he's not in front of the Pope here. He's in front of Charles, the emperor. And so you need to remove from your mind the idea of a separation of church and state that, that we have in our American culture. It's not, it's not the way things worked then. It's actually debated whether Luther said, here I stand. Uh, the famous book by Roland Baden, Here I Stand, is probably the most popular biography on Luther. It's actually debatable whether Luther actually said those words, here I stand. But Robert Kolb, another biographer on Luther, says the reality nonetheless, nonetheless that he had taken his stand was apparent, whether the exact words were spoken or not. And so the events leading up to this moment, what happened afterwards, why it all took place, this is the subject matter of why we're here. And so I want to acknowledge in this room, there's at least two perspectives walking into this room today. Um, there's typically in every church at least two or three diehards that are like, finally, the Reformation. Like you want uh, a mighty fortress is our God by Luther to be sung every single Sunday. Uh, you're the guy who's got the bobblehead. You've got opinions, and they all come back to the five solas. You love the courage and clarity of theological thinking that can come from studying Reformation theology. That's one group. Uh, but I suspect that in this group, there's, there's more that's in, in this category. That for many others, that when we talk about the Reformation, you know there's something that's important about it. You know that this is the moment where there's no longer just the Catholic Church. Uh, things, uh, things become more complicated. It's all kind of mysterious, though, even though you know it's important. You go, what is the fuss about? Perhaps you might say, why can't we just read the Bible, Aaron, and leave it at that? I've just, I've got, I've got Jesus in the Bible. That's all I need. Um, who cares about historical figures, church history, historical theology, let alone a particular movement in 2,000 years of church history, one period? Why, why should I care? And I think this question of who cares leads us to a 
some comments I want to make about worldview. So, uh, a person's worldview, and, and speaking specifically about our post-enlightenment, post-revivalist religious worldview. Let me give you a definition of what I mean by this word. When I say worldview, help me out here. Uh, is that somewhat familiar? Raise your hand if that's familiar. Okay. So we, we, we've heard about this. Let me give you a definition of worldview. I'm going to give you a big one, and I'm going to give you a concise one. This comes from the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology. He said, the author there says, In a realist Christian perspective, a worldview is first and foremost an outlook on reality. Right? An outlook on reality. Composed of basic presuppositions about its composition and character, by means of which humans, humans situate themselves in the world and interact and interpret their lived experience intelligibly and as meaningful. Short version, your worldview, it's right there in the word, it's how you see the world around you. It's the lens that you're wearing. And it can vary, it can vary according to how you were raised, the kind of home you, that you grew up in, the kind of economic and social environment that you had, all these kinds of factors, the religious climate in which you grow up in. And all of those things impact the lenses that we wear when we walk into interpreting either the Bible or our world around us. It's really true, I think, in regard to our religious beliefs. I, I don't want you to think or assume for a moment that when you read your Bible, you're reading it without bringing anything to the text. We all bring our luggage. We all have something in how we, in how we view the Bible. If you don't believe me, uh, do something I've been doing for the last uh, 10 years or so in my Bible, which is over there. If I were to open it up, you'll see that I've journaled in the side, and especially in the Psalms. Maybe you've done this. Maybe you've been in a tough moment, or you see that passage in a certain way, and you go, this is what I see right now, Lord. It's really interesting for me. Seven years removed from some of those things I wrote, I come back to the same verse, and I go, I see that verse completely differently now. Um, I've grown in certain ways. I've had certain experiences that happen. The, the word of God has not changed, but I, as the interpreter, have changed. Notice what I said there. There is a difference between God's word, which is true, it's infallible, never errors, and our interpretations of God's word. Don't just say the Bible says. You might be better off saying, here's how I see the Bible, right? There's two Western impulses that affect how we walk into reading our Bible, interpreting the world around us, and other things. I want to list a couple of them. I think if we do this, it'll help us get underneath some of the layers that keep us from appreciating the Reformation. The first one. C.S. Lewis has called this first one chronological snobbery. I love this. What is newer is better. This comes from enlightenment thinking. C.S. Lewis referred to what some have referred to, has referred to chronological snobbery, essentially the uncritical acceptance of the intellectual climate common to our own age and the assumption that whatever has gone out of date is on that account discredited. Or as J.I. Packer says, the newer is the truer. Only what is recent is decent. Every shift of ground is a step forward and every latest word must be hailed as the, last, as the final word on the subject. And so, us in the West have a tendency to not want to listen to the voices of the past, but to focus on the most recent thing. We think that we know best chronological snobbery. What, what a phrase to get locked into your head. And so, in the Enlightenment period, which is a period in the 17th and 18th century, uh, essentially it was a period in modern, modernity that uh, became very optimistic about man's ability to understand. Very optimistic. Ability to reason and to discover. And with this ability to understand and be able to interpret the world and discover, there became a skepticism for tradition and what man had said up until that point. With Copernicus and Galileo and various scientific uh, figures contributed to science, it unraveled some of the long-held assumptions that the world had had about how, about the Earth's place in the universe, right? And so... Jeff Bingham has said, if we on our own can know complete truth now, then what people thought in the past is irrelevant. What is most recent is best. That's the mindset. You with me? This is the mindset. Okay. So it asks you to check your impulses. Do you naturally find just the concept of anything in history to be boring? It's possible 
You had a bad history teacher. Let's acknowledge that first, first of all. I had a terrible teacher. I will not name him because this is being recorded. Just realize that right now. <laughs> At Tabor College. Where did you pay? If you went to Tabor, when I went, you know who I'm talking about. Terrible teacher. I did not enjoy church history. But then when I went to Southwestern and I heard a new teacher was fascinated, he was riveted about what he was talking about. It began to rub off. Okay? But do you find things that are in the old to be that are older to be worthless? It's likely that you may be influenced as a son or daughter of the Enlightenment. Let's go a step further. You tend towards a skepticism of what can even be known. You may be a son or a daughter of post-enlightenment thinking more than you realize. Let me give you a second thing. That's the first one, is this chronological snobbery that we have of looking at the past and going, I don't need it. Second one that can affect our worldview is, is this motto. I just need the Bible and Jesus. Uh, and this is anti-intellectualism. And, and it comes from a variety of sources, but I think one of them is, uh, is the post-revival world that we live in, in America particularly. The revivalism that comes out of the 19th century. Uh, you may be more influenced by the, the Second Great Awakening than you realize as an evangelical. When I hear somebody say, man, we just need a Third Great Awakening, we need a revival in our country, I naturally go, kind of. And here's why I do that. I do that because, um, if you mean by mass salvation, I'm for that, of course. And I think it's what most people mean. But if you remember, it's out of the 19th century Second Great Awakening that many of the odd cults and groups, such as the, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or Jehovah's Witnesses, certain holiness movements, all of these strange movements come out of the Second Great Awakening. You also get an anti-intellectualism that questions authority. Uh, in that time, in the early part of the, the, the 19th century, late 18th century, early 19th century, there was a questioning of authority that went simultaneously with the Revolutionary War, questioning England, no one stands over me. That mindset carries over right into the church as well. You don't stand over me. And so for those who were more uh, seminary trained, intellectual, the high churches of that day, they were actually looked down upon by many that were the commoners. And so it was replaced for an anti-authority perspective that promoted more of a pragmatic look. I would ask you to be careful when you approach the scriptures and think about your own beliefs. Failure to understand how American revivals in the 19th century, failure to understand how evangelicalism gets underway in this country, um, you, you may end up thinking that your beliefs are Christian when in fact they may just be American in certain ways. And here's, here's the point. My desire as I'm pointing out two of these things is that you'd be able to take off the lenses and say, let me evaluate my own. Is it true that I um, have things that need to be corrected? In fact, by observing that you are wearing lenses, that's the first step. Now, I am not a postmodern person that says we can't really know anything. I believe that we can. I just believe that we need to be careful in how we approach things, assuming that we are just we're just coming to either the Bible or things like this with a clean slate. Perhaps if we listen to the voices of the past, it'll help us be able to evaluate these lenses more clearly. As we hear from Christians throughout the corridors of time, to be challenged. To see if our own views are really biblical. To see how others have interpreted. To avoid this chronological snobbery. And perhaps there's really good things along the way in church history that we've missed. By the way, when I say church history, I, I want to make a distinction between church history and historical theology. When I'm talking about church history, I'm talking about the events. When I'm talking about historical theology, I'm talking about the beliefs of the people in that day in context and how they developed. So historical theology, more so the convictions. And that, by the way, is what we're most interested in. So while we're here, we're, though it may be interesting to talk about how things develop in, in history, I really want you to get the theology of what some of these guys believe. To compare that to yourself. To see what they had that maybe 
you're missing or what may be strange or why they look at the Bible in a certain way and you never would have come to that same conclusion. It's good to do that. Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy, he says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred teachings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. It's critical that we pass on the truth from one generation to the next. I think we're seeing right now as there are there, the category of nuns, not N-U-N, but N-O-N-E-S in our American society is growing. I had a friend of mine who uh, had gone to a conference in Florida. He was a pastor in Colorado and he had gone to a conference. And the conference was all about getting people back in church, how to get people back to church. And it assumed that most people had a framework for the Christian faith. And he said, for me here in my part of Denver, it's not about getting people back into church. It's that we're several generations, it's one, two, three generations removed from Christianity. And so it's not like things, things, things are kind of fuzzy and we need to remind them. We have to start from square one. This is what happens when you do not pass on the convictions of our faith from one, from one generation to the next. And Paul is telling Timothy, don't forget what you learned. Pass it on. Maybe there's things from the Reformation that we need to hear again so that we would pass it on. I think it's helpful to do this because it helps us see how history repeats ourself. Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, what has been done, what has been is, is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there's nothing new under the sun, right? We know that we're familiar with that. And this is true of human behavior. It's true of false beliefs. It's so good to study historical theology because you can find that many of the heresies that we see in our culture today are not new. Many of the teachings I, I, I find myself more often than not, it might be because of proximity, um, pointing out the false teachings of the, of the Mormon church, so-called church. But the truth is many of their convictions go back to Arianism in the third and fourth century. You can find it there. And so it's good to see how church history repeats itself. It's also good to be inspired, like we looked at with the story of Luther. Inspired by the witnesses and testimonies of these people, how they stood up. It helps us think about what are the things in our day that we need to stand up for as well. What are the things that we're standing up for, as he did? You notice how I'm talking. I'm talking about understanding for the sake of appropriation. Do you notice that? I'm not just talking about for the sake of understanding. Last summer, I had the, I had to justify why I'm doing this course. I, I spent a whole month in Germany, so I've got to tell somebody about it. So um, <laughs> that picture top left is the Lucoria, where um, I had the privilege uh, last June to be able to go with a whole bunch of uh, student fellows to Wittenberg, Germany. Wittenberg is the base of operations of where the Reformation began, began referred to the 95 theses that were posted. Um, that happened uh, here in Wittenberg. It's for Luther and um, other characters like Philip Melanchthon, uh, who was a, uh, a young uh, professor of Greek when he came in the early 1520s uh, to uh, Wittenberg. And, and so you see some of those students was privileged to be alongside um, men and women from, from Oxford, Yale, Vanderbilt, uh, Master Seminary, Baylor University, uh, Helsinki, and then myself from Southwestern. Uh, we stayed at, you see the Lacoria up there, but it's right across the street. When you see that center picture, why, why do I have a picture of a tree? Because that is the spot where Luther, uh, just a few months before he was summoned uh, to go to the Diet of Worms, uh, he took uh, a document called Excarge Domine, Arise, O Lord, that had threatened excommunication from the Pope. And there's a, a famous painting where he's burning uh, this, uh, this document and saying, you know, you know take, take that. Well, he does that right there. We've got to stay right across the street from where all of these famous moments in the Reformation had happened. And so we got to study and learn about the Lutheran Reformation. Someone had asked me, and he's not in here this morning, had asked me on my first day here, I know that you went to Germany. Uh, are you going to make all of us Lutheran because you studied Luther? And I want to assure you, the answer is no. No, we're not going to do that. Um, but we'll focus on Luther more in lectures three and four. Uh, if you had that three by five uh, a couple Sundays ago, we have them 
uh, out at the Welcome Center. It'll tell you what we'll do. One of the things I observed, though, while I was there, as a coming from a pastoral churchman perspective, was how German education worked. We had a, a Lutheran professor, a Lutheran German professor, and the style of teaching was set up just so that you would make sure to get the facts straight. He was more concerned about making sure that you understood history. This guy could tell you what Luther was doing on this date at this time. It was incredible. But the end point was precision in understanding, not for the sake of appropriating for personal belief. That was a line. Who cares what your opinion was? That's kind of how we approached it. Who cares what your personal opinion is? I want to make sure that you can get the facts straight. That's, that's where this man was. That's not what we're doing here. Uh, we're not going to do that. I believe that theology is best done in the local church. There's a reason why, along some of my colleagues and friends, I did not stay in the academy. I find it very boring to be a walking book review. Um, that, that is not something that fills me up with a passion. Uh, I believe that it's better to do theology in the local church because it's not like a test tube in the classroom. In the church, you see the consequences of your beliefs. It's one thing to say, I believe this, but then you see application. Application happens right here. I'm so much more interested uh, to do this. And if, if not for another reason, it's because we're also doing life together. So it's not just theology, it's for theology and community. I love that. So our approach isn't going to be to just understand facts. It's so that we would understand what's happened here and then be shaped and challenged for ourselves. So um, let's give ourselves a framework uh, for, uh, I'll talk a little bit. This right here is a, a, a little video of, of the, the square in, in Wittenberg. And you'll see that there's two statues. One is of Luther, the other is of Philip Melanchthon. In the background there, you see that big castle in the background? That's, that's the castle church. At the bottom of that, that's where Luther posted his 95 theses. Um, there's Luther. There's Melanchthon over there. And it's going to pan out and go to another church, and that's the parish church where Luther did most of his preaching at. So there's two main churches in town. Got to go to the top of that, and I'll show you some pictures another time. But I'll let that keep going while I'm speaking. The Reformation is generally understood as uh, the first, for all intents and purposes, we're talking about the first 50 years of the 16th century. Uh, you have some guys who will divide it from, uh, you have Stephen Osmond who will divide from 1250 all the way to 1550. You'll have other guys um, like um, Carlos Iyer who will divide it up 1450 to 1650. But for our purposes, we're really focusing on the first 50 years of the 16th century, 1500 to about 1550. And it's generally understood as that period in which the one Catholic church ends up splintering into a whole bunch of different movements. There's different ways to categorize these movements. You can categorize them according to time. Uh, you can categorize them geographically. Uh, but we're going to categorize them according to persons and movements. It's the, probably the most well-known way to do it, and it's the most traditional. So let me put up this, this picture here. We're going to focus on four main movements. The Lutheran Reformation, the Reformed Reformation, the Radical Reformation, and the Catholic Reformation. And so, Reformation, I'm talking about those 50 years. You notice when I'm saying Reformation, I'm including the Catholics in this as well. This is why we use the word Protestant Reformation, because that refers to the first three groups here. Uh, strictly speaking, the Protestants were those who protested against the practices and beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church. So that's going to exclude Catholics. And more specifically, that word pro Protestant, those who protest, was used at, a, at the Diet of Spire in 1529. So if you want to be really precise, uh, you can't use Protestant until after 1529. That would be anachronistic. You notice I have the word magisterial underneath uh, Luther and John Calvin here. And, and that means this. It refers to those who had a close relationship between the, the magistrate and the church, between the state and church. Luther relies on Frederick the Wise to protect him. And Luther would never have made it as far as he did without the protection of Frederick. We'll talk more about him. Same thing with Calvin. 
Calvin is accountable to the city council. In fact, they throw him out after just a few years of doing ministry. And later on, they call him back. So there's always this tension with Calvin in the city of Geneva with the, with the, the political leaders in the, the, the state there. Okay? So just briefly, Lutheran Reformation. Magisterial, Luther relies on Frederick the Wise for his protection. Its base is in Wittenberg. Uh, major events include the posting of the 95 Theses, and it's really within an academic context. Um, it's connected strongly with Luther. It's, this is what's different than the other movement, movements. It has his name in it. It's strongly connected to Luther himself. Other major figures include Andreas von Karlstadt, Philip Melanchthon. We'll talk about this. On the other side, you have the Reform Reformation. Reform F Reformation uh, starts in Zurich eventually ends up, it's, it's really center, it includes Basel and Bern, but really Geneva is where things take place. Uh, first generation include a man named uh, Holdrick or Ulrich Zwingli, who dies in 1531. Uh, he's the one who gets things started in Zurich, but later on it's John Calvin, really, and we'll, we'll focus on both of those men. Uh, these men were greatly influenced by what was called humanism, um, ad fontis, back to the sources that focused on uh, the original texts and, um, and, and focused on character and ethics in a way that the Lutheran Reformation focuses on theology first and foremost. So there's a difference between these two movements. There's a confusion I've noticed among seminary students and amongst pastors and a lot of people. It's, it's the word Calvinism. I say Calvinism, but you're preaching if you know what I'm talking about. If you've heard that, somewhat familiar with that. Calvinism versus the, the term reform. Which one should we be using? Strictly speaking, Calvinism talks about the teachings of John Calvin. And so um, I, I much prefer for somebody to say, I'm reformed, not a Calvinist, because I always want to go, do you believe in all the teachings of John Calvin? Um, you have the reformed church, which Calvin is a part, take much of his viewpoints, but it's developed. And so if you're standing within that tradition, it's probably better to say I'm reformed. We'll explain the actual teachings of this tradition, but understand there's a distinction between the person of Calvin and the Reformed Church. Calvin fits within this movement. My favorite is the Radical Reformation, and that's a picture of, uh, who knows who that is? Men of Science. Men of Science, okay. Men of Science. So, so out of, um, there's a group called the Anabaptists, and that it was a derogatory term because these people were all Catholic who renounced their infant baptism. And so they believed they needed to get baptized as believers for the first time. And so if you didn't like that person, you'd say, what are you doing getting re-baptized? You're, you're an Anabaptist. You see that? Okay. And so the, there's various groups here uh, underneath the heading of the Radical Reformation. The trouble with this category, I see this over and over in, in older literature, is that Anabaptists get lumped in with other disparate groups that they don't agree with. It's kind of a catch-all. Radical Reformation. And so it's not magisterial. They actually get shot at by both sides. Uh, the, the Reformers, the Magisterial Reformation, Luther, Calvin, those guys, don't like these people. And on the other side, the Catholics don't like these people. And so this group uh, did not have, these groups did not have the backing of the government. And so you, I think, as we go on, you'll see that there's a lot of affinity that we'll have and how we as Americans think of the separation of church and state with how the Anabaptists in particular saw how the church was supposed to function. Uh, their progeny, but I forgot to mention this, prog progeny in the Reformed tradition includes Presbyterianism, the Dutch Reformed Church, Reformed Church in America, and maybe I know at least one of us has come out of Presbyterianism. Um, progeny for the Radical Reformation includes the Mennonites, Hutterites, Hutterites, sorry, Amish, <laughs> What about the Baptists here? Now, Baptists don't start up until the, 16th, until the 17th century. The best thing I think we could say is that Baptists are like cousins to the Anabaptists. They were separate in how they got started, but they're approaching the Bible in the same way. And so I'm going to show you my bias here. So they naturally come to the right conclusion on the church. <laughs> <laughs> There's the Catholic Reformation. Some have referred, or in the older literature, it was called the Counter-Reformation. Uh, 
and it refers particularly to the reforms that the church herself made in 1545 at the Council of Trent. And so we shouldn't think, this is where I had the Catholic Church up here, you shouldn't think that the Catholic Church didn't see her own problems, the abuses and the issues that they had. Uh, they just went about things differently, slowly, and by the time they started re reforming themselves, it was way too late. And so old scholarly work called this the Counter-Reformation. The reason why it's not used that way anymore is because in the Counter-Reformation, um, it seemed merely as a response to the Protestant Reformation, but they're really reforming themselves. Uh, results where they dealt with abuses, uh, they responded against Protestant teachings, they established the Society of Jesus known as the Jesuits, you ever heard of them? But I want to read to you one thing that they, they affirmed and denied um, in uh, the Council of Trent. This is what they said about justification. The church still holds this, I believe, to this day. So think about this, the official teaching of the Catholic Church on justification. If anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified in such wise to man, that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the obtaining of the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his will. In other words, faith alone is what's required for justification. Let him be anathema. That's what the Council of Trent says. That's official teaching from the Catholic Church. So keep that in mind when ecumenical talk is given between Catholics and Protestants. Official teachings, the Catholic Church is not on board with how you and I view justification. What's the impact of the Reformation? Um, you can trace denominations back to this moment. That's why it's so fascinating, is that you can see how so many things get started because it removes the papacy as an organizing principle, and therefore groups can, can form themselves just how they want to form themselves. You see that the Reformation impacts greatly also Social, there's social changes. It's not just a theological movement. The pattern of, if you and I were to teleport to 1500, you'd see that the pattern of the day was to have 30 to 39 religious holidays. What a deal, right? 30 to 39, right? Uh, the clergy were single during that time. They did not get married, except in, in many cases you wanted to pay a fee and then you could have your, your mistress or mistresses over off to the side um, for some in Catholic hierarchy. Uh, there's a focus and a concern about purgatory in the way that you and I do not think of. We'll talk about that. Uh, there is a move that takes place in the Reformation from working to save one's soul as a pilgrim. Stephen Osborne was reading this last week. That the mindset is always thinking about how do I as a pilgrim live in such a way so that the scales will be in my favor at the end. You cannot have confidence that you will not be in purgatory. You may have to atone for your sins. That, that, that's the mindset. There's not a resting in the finished work of Christ in this period. You have a result of all these splinterings. There's another social change. Europeans, uh, European nations have uh, developed, and there's wars that happen. The Thirty Years' War, where 25 to 35 percent of Europe is killed. And by some estimates, it is the largest loss of life that happens before World War I. We, talk, we refer to the Enlightenment. There's been conversation about how it's connected to this uh, movement of modernity. There's developments of confessions and theology. To this day, you can look at reform, the Reformed Church, and you can look at Lutherans and see how they have different convictions on things. And those things still go down to this day. Predestination, things like that. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, church polity. So that's some of the, the impacts of the Reformation. Let's end our time, and I want to give you a, one more piece of framework. So if I've given you those, those main categories of the Reformation, okay, I've given you the Lutheran, I've given you the Reformed Church, I've given you the Reform Movement, I've given you the Radicals, and I've given you the Catholic. That's kind of a vertical uh, way to think about it. Let's now approach it from the side and talk about the five solas. Who's, that, who's heard of the five solas here before? Okay. It's familiar to some of us. Okay. Sola Scriptura. You can actually, I think, when you read the writings of Calvin and his institutes, you can, you can put to the side Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, Sola, Sola Gratia, and you can see these. Scripture alone. 
in this period, Christians came to believe that it was the Pope who had the final word to speak ex cathedra, to sit on his throne and to be able to speak as the mouthpiece of God. They said the Pope can err, the church can err, tradition can err, but the Bible does not. The Bible is our final authority in matters of teaching and of salvation. I, I should say, I think you, can, you should affirm these things, by the way. The church is the final authority. Okay? Sorry, the, the, the scriptures are the final authority. Secondly, solus Christus. The work of Christ alone is the basis for our, our justification. It's not what we have done, our works, but his finished work. So is Christus, what he's done. Sola fide refers to faith alone. How do you receive Christ's finished work on the cross? Do you, do you merit work to put God in favor in, your, in, his, in his eyes? Do you, do you love like he would love so that like would... would, would would attract like so that as you're more loving, he who is loving is attracted to you? No. Luther and Calvin and others said it is by faith alone we trust in the finished work of Christ and we receive his righteousness. It is an alien righteousness of Christ given to us. Solo gratia. Grace alone. We did not look for the Lord. We did not seek him. We were dead. You cannot look at a dead body and say, Get up. Uh, Christ must pursue us. It is by grace we have been saved. Or some might say monergism, not synergism. In other words, it is, it is Christ's work alone. It's not a combination of my work and your work, work with Christ. It brings a lifeless to life. The last one, sola Deo Gloria. If Christ has done the work, friends, and you have not, he gets the credit. And so he alone is worthy, and we are humble before him. This is a little bit about the central teachings of the Reformation, and we'll look at this more together uh, as time goes on. I want to finish with a final quote, and then I'll be done. Peter Du Bois, writing 300 years before Luther, says this, We are like dwarfs standing on the shores of giants. Thanks to them, we see farther than they, busying ourselves with the treatises written by the ancients. We take their choice thoughts buried by age and human neglect, and we raise them, as it were, from death to a new life. And that's a little introduction on the Reformation. Okay, how are we doing on time? Great. What I want to do, part of why I'm doing this, it's purely selfish in these eight weeks. I have my comprehensive exams coming up here um, in October, and I am straight up using this to my own advantage. Um, while I hope that what we do will be a blessing to you as well. So I want to invite questions, because um, I'm going to be asked questions. That, uh, to, you don't pass go when, you, when you're doing doctoral work. Um, if, if, you don't, if you don't pass questions, that will be asked to you about the, the field of study that you have. So this is an introduction on the Reformation. Any questions on what we've talked about so far today? want to open that up for anybody. Doug? When I used to work in, back in New Jersey, I had this Greek Orthodox guy I worked with, and he, he, he had a big chart or something that he showed me one time, and he said, we were going, we were reformed way before the Catholic Church. <laughs> so he's over here, and the, you know, it just branches off into all these different ones, but I'm glad we're focusing on this, because I don't know enough about this either. <laughs> yeah, so, so you're referring to the Greek Orthodox Church. So first, my first exposure to the Orthodox Church was in a mission trip to Romania. Um, and it, it was really, it was really fascinating to see how it was like it was Catholic, but yet it wasn't. And so, um, you know, how I've talked, I talked about the one Roman Catholic Church. Really, truly, um, there's an elephant in the room. And it's like, no, there, there's another church too, and it's been existing since the beginning. So, from the time of Christ and the apostles get started, there is one church that ends up having a schism in 1054. Um, known as the great schism between East and West. And so uh, you had the patriarch in Constantinople um, who kind of mirrors the, the Pope in Rome. And they end up splitting off. There's a variety of reasons for it. But part, part of it is because of difference of beliefs on the Trinity. 
uh, different beliefs on, on church authority and structures, things like that. So there still is an Orthodox church that exists to this day. Uh, you and I tend to be people of the West, so we come and talk about the, the Catholic church and coming out of that by comparison. So we won't really talk about the Orthodox, but don't forget that they're there too. Okay. Other questions? Um, when you had Luther at the beginning, um, why was he still speaking in Latin? Was he speaking like, why was the king the one he was speaking to, where was the Pope? Wouldn't it have been yeah. the Pope that should be there? So first, we'll talk more in detail about the circumstances around all of this. Remember that Charles V, who, who was was newly uh, king after, uh, emperor after Maximilian, uh, starting in 1519, <coughs> Charles, part of, part of the thing of, about being a leader in this time is that you want to keep order in Christendom. And so the idea of an, of a, of an errant rebel monk stirring up religious trouble, it's not that he just has a difference of viewpoint. He's messing with the fabric of Christendom. And so Charles, one of his big things was that he wanted to keep all things Catholic. And so he, there, he had a political stake in all of this as well. And so it's not just the Pope, it, it's also um, it's, it's also the magistrate that's involved here. It's just so important that we remember that the two are intimately connected um, in a way that we don't think about. And so part of it is to keep order. That's a big part. Of it. Uh, I think Charles also was a strong Catholic believer himself. And so we'll talk more about the, the, the Pope. Um, and another time, I should say this, in this day, in the late part of the 15th and early part of the 16th century, the Pope's authority had been going down dramatically in the and with the rise of nation states, the emperor, kings, people like that, their authority was rising. So um, I think that contributes. I hope that's scratching where you're itching. Other questions? Was Luther acting alone, or did, was he just the spokesperson for a group of people that were thinking the same way? This was fascinating. Um, it, it, it is Luther who does not intend one of the things that we'll do is we'll do our best to do some myth busting along the way. Um, you should not have in your mind an image of this, this, this strong monk with a huge hammer that just goes and starts breaking down Catholic doors and throwing up 95 theses everywhere. Uh, that's not what's happening. He is a scholar who is attempting to ref raise points of discussion as an academic from within and to reform from within the church. He never expects that this moment is going to come in 1517. And so he, he does this by himself, but that's not to say that there's not other figures um, who are raising the alarm as well. But it's Luther who really gets it going. So it's, yes, there is a sense of a both and, but don't miss the significance of what Luther does. Yeah, Erasmus is one of those. We'll talk about him. Nailing stuff to the, uh, the, the castle door, that was more of a common thing. He had a that's true. community of Ben that's right. issue with the church, right? That's true, yes. Okay. Question for you. I have a book. Can, get out? Can anybody here, raise your hand, name the five solas? The five solas. <coughs> you can do it in English. So, so what, someone got to raise their hand. So, who, who's, who's got courage? Norma. Uh -huh. You're missing one. Sola. There it is. Sola gratia. There it is. Okay. This book right here, if you want to walk alongside us in these next eight weeks, it's called The Unquenchable Flame. Um, I'm going to teach as if I'm teaching the college level class. Couldn't tell. Um, but I like books that not only are on college and seminary level, I, I like good books that, that, that start at the ground level. Get this book if you don't have it, uh, if you're interested in going further. It's Unquenchable Flame uh, by Michael Reeves, same author of the book that we gave out uh, on the Trinity uh, a few months ago. Okay? Okay, let me pray for us. Lord, you are good. As we go to our worship service now, let us shift gears. Let's focus on the present and see what you have done for us. So we worship like with like-minded brothers and sisters. It's an honor to do that. Jesus, we thank you for what you've done on the cross for us, your finished work that we have received by faith alone in Christ alone. 
We pray these things to God's glory alone. Amen.